In the early hours of August 29, 2005, nature unfurled a disaster so profound, it etched a permanent scar on the heart of America. Hurricane Katrina, as if angry at the world, descended upon the Gulf Coast with winds that could only be described as wrathful and a surge akin to an immense wall of doom. The city of New Orleans, vibrant with its jazz and jambalaya, found itself submerged under the raging waters of the Gulf, turning streets into rivers and homes, into memories. This event was not merely a natural disaster, it was a profound moment of reckoning about socioeconomic disparities, emergency preparedness, and human vulnerability. The narrative of Hurricane Katrina involves more than meteorological statistics. It involves real human tragedies, systemic failures, and the indomitable spirit of recovery. It is a tale that necessitates a deep dive into the chronology of the catastrophe, the fervent cries for help from stranded victims, the controversial responses from government bodies, and the heartfelt aid delivered by nonprofits and ordinary citizens alike. Hurricane Katrina began as a rather unremarkable tropical depression over the Bahamas on August 23, 2005. By the time it reached the Gulf of Mexico, however, it had transformed into a Category 5 hurricane, the highest possible rating on the Saffir-Simpson scale. Meteorologists watched in alarm as the hurricane's pressure readings plummeted, signaling an extraordinarily powerful storm was at hand. Warnings were issued with unprecedented urgency. The National Weather Service and the National Hurricane Center both predicted severe destruction, yet the true scale of the impending disaster seemed almost inconceivable. As Katrina churned towards the Gulf Coast, millions braced for impact, oblivious to the fact that their lives would soon be changed forever. The storm's path was tracked meticulously. Predictive models showed a significant threat to New Orleans, a city particularly vulnerable due to its below sea level elevation and inadequate flood defenses. Despite this, the full scope of what was about to unfold could hardly be grasped by those in harm's way. On the eve of the hurricane, New Orleans was a bustling metropolis, celebrated for its rich cultural heritage and vibrant nightlife. The city's population was diverse, with a significant number of residents living below the poverty line, many without the means to evacuate effectively. The geographic and engineering vulnerabilities were well known. New Orleans was essentially a bowl, surrounded by water, with much of the city lying below sea level. The levees and pumps that were designed to protect this unique city were aged and not constructed to withstand a storm of Katrina's predicted force. This was a disaster waiting to happen, yet the festive spirit of the city masked these grim realities. When Katrina made landfall on August 29th, it brought with it winds of up to 125 mech, and a storm surge exceeding 20 feet in some areas. The city felt the fury of the storm immediately, roofs were torn off, windows shattered, and streets flooded. By mid-morning New Orleans was transforming into an aquatic wasteland. Residents who had not evacuated found themselves trapped. One such person was Elise Richardson, a nurse who chose to stay behind to care for her elderly patients. She recounts, the water came so fast it was like the walls just gave up. We moved everyone to higher floors, praying for a miracle. The scope of the catastrophe became clear when reports of significant levee breaches began to surface. The Industrial Canal, the 17th Street Canal, and the London Avenue Canal were compromised, unleashing a torrential influx of water into residential areas. The city's defenses were faltering, and its people were at the mercy of the rising waters. As the storm continued, the situation worsened. The failure of the levee system led to catastrophic flooding. Over 80% of the city was underwater, some parts submerged under 20 feet of water. Homes were swept away or completely submerged, leaving thousands stranded on rooftops and in attics. Infrastructure crumbled, power lines fell, and communication was severely disrupted. Emergency services were overwhelmed, with rescue operations becoming increasingly hazardous. The vast scale of the flooding made traditional rescue methods nearly impossible, requiring creative and daring approaches to save those trapped. The historic Ninth Ward was hit particularly hard. Here, the water rose so swiftly that many residents had no time to flee. John Thompson, a resident of the Ninth Ward, shares his harrowing experience. The water was up to my neck in minutes. 
I had to break through the roof with my bare hands to save myself and my son. The Superdome, initially a refuge for those who could not evacuate, quickly became a symbol of desperation and despair. Over 20,000 people crowded into the arena, facing appalling conditions. The facility, lacking adequate sanitation, food and water became a hotbed for tension and misery. Outside the Superdome, the situation was no less dire. The convention center where thousands more had taken refuge was also overwhelmed. Supplies were scarce and the heat was oppressive. Reports of violence and chaos within these makeshift shelters began to emerge, painting a grim picture of the breakdown of societal norms under extreme stress. Efforts to evacuate the stranded were fraught with challenges, buses were few, and the logistics of moving large numbers of people from a disaster zone were daunting. Many residents, like Marsha Hill, felt abandoned. We were there for days with no help in sight. It felt like the world had forgotten us. The response from government bodies was widely criticized for its inefficiency and lack of coordination. Local, state, and federal officials struggled to provide a unified strategy, leading to confusion and delays in aid delivery. President Bush's administration was particularly scrutinized for its handling of the situation, which many perceived as detached and inadequate. FEMA, the agency responsible for coordinating the federal response to disasters, was overwhelmed by the magnitude of the crisis. Criticisms abounded regarding the speed and effectiveness of their operations. Former FEMA director Michael Brown faced intense scrutiny and eventually resigned, symbolizing the broader failures of government during this critical time. Despite these challenges, there were also notable efforts to improve coordination and accelerate relief. Joint operations between different levels of government gradually took shape and aid started flowing more smoothly into the affected areas. However, for many, this help came too late. As images of the devastated New Orleans flooded television screens and social media platforms around the world, international reaction was one of shock and sympathy. Countries and international organizations offered aid and support, highlighting the global impact of the disaster. The media played a crucial role in shaping public opinion, with relentless coverage that brought the human suffering into living rooms worldwide. This coverage also sparked a broader debate about climate change, poverty, and racial inequalities, framing Katrina not just as a natural disaster, but as a socio-political watershed. The U.S.'s international image was affected, with some critics pointing out the irony of the world's superpower struggling to manage a domestic crisis. This global scrutiny added pressure on U.S. officials to rethink disaster preparedness and response strategies. In the midst of the chaos, numerous stories of heroism emerged. The U.S. Coast Guard, for instance, conducted around 33,500 rescues, both by air and boat, in one of the largest such operations in history. Volunteers from across the country came to aid, forming what would later be known as the Cajun Navy, a civilian flotilla that performed countless rescues. Nonprofit organizations like the Red Cross and international groups such as Médecins Sans Frontières played pivotal roles in providing medical aid and basic supplies. The immediate response, although fraught with challenges, showcased the resilience and solidarity of both local and international communities. One of the most touching rescue stories was that of an elderly couple, saved from their attic by a volunteer firefighter who heard their cries for help. We thought we were going to die there, they later recounted, but he came like an angel through the storm. Hurricane Katrina claimed over 1,800 lives making it one of the deadliest hurricanes in U.S. history. The toll was not just in immediate deaths, many more suffered from injuries and the psychological impact was profound. The trauma of loss, displacement and the harrowing experiences during the storm left deep psychological scars on survivors. Health issues also plagued the survivors. The floodwaters were highly contaminated leading to outbreaks of diseases. The healthcare infrastructure was heavily damaged, complicating efforts to treat the injured and ill. Mental health services were overwhelmed, with many professionals themselves affected by the disaster. Children and the elderly were particularly vulnerable. 
Reports of missing children were rampant in the aftermath and many elderly residents, unable to cope with the stress, suffered greatly. The social fabric of communities was tested as never before. The economic devastation wrought by Katrina was staggering. The total damage was estimated at $125 billion, making it one of the costliest natural disasters in U.S. history. The local economy of New Orleans and the broader Gulf region was hit hard, with thousands of businesses destroyed or severely damaged. The impact on employment was severe, with many losing their jobs overnight. The tourism industry, a vital part of New Orleans' economy, was particularly affected. Many small businesses struggled to recover, and insurance disputes became common, adding to the financial strain on residents. Federal and state disaster funds flowed in, but the process was often slow, and many found the compensation inadequate to cover their losses. The rebuilding process was fraught with challenges, including bureaucratic delays and the monumental task of reconstructing a major city. The long road to recovery involved not just rebuilding the physical infrastructure, but also a comprehensive reform of emergency management systems. New levees were constructed, designed to withstand a similar disaster in the future. Homes and businesses slowly rose from the ruins, supported by both government aid and private investment. Significant changes were made in how emergencies were managed. The aftermath of Katrina led to a re-evaluation of disaster preparedness protocols, not just in New Orleans, but across the United States. The disaster also sparked a broader discussion about urban planning and resilience, influencing policies nationwide. Social reforms were also evident. The disaster highlighted the sharp socio-economic divides within New Orleans, prompting initiatives aimed at reducing poverty and improving the overall quality of life for all residents. Community groups became more active, driven by a renewed sense of urgency to address long-standing issues. Hurricane Katrina became a case study in what can go wrong during a major natural disaster and how better to prepare for future events. The lessons learned were numerous, from the need for more robust infrastructure to the importance of quick and coordinated governmental response. Policies were overhauled to provide better disaster response and recovery frameworks. Training for emergency personnel was intensified, and new communication strategies were developed to handle widespread infrastructure failures. The disaster also highlighted the need for greater attention to social inequalities that exacerbate the impacts of such events. Programs aimed at helping low-income families in disaster-prone areas were strengthened, reflecting a more holistic approach to disaster preparedness. Fifteen years on, the legacy of Hurricane Katrina is still very much alive in the collective memory of America. Annual commemorations are held, both to remember those who were lost and to celebrate the resilience of those who survived. The event has been deeply etched into the cultural narrative of the country. Memorials have been erected in New Orleans serving as poignant reminders of the tragedy and the subsequent renewal. The story of Katrina is also used as a cautionary tale, a reminder of the power of nature and the necessity for human preparedness. Challenges remain, however. Many areas in New Orleans have not fully recovered, and the threat of future hurricanes looms large. The journey of recovery and preparation is ongoing, a testament to the enduring impact of the disaster. This essay has provided a comprehensive overview of Hurricane Katrina, from its meteorological beginnings to its lasting impact on individuals, communities, and policies. For those seeking further information, these resources offer valuable insights into one of the most significant natural disasters in recent history. These include National Hurricane Center reports, FEMA after action reports, survivor testimonials and interviews, and academic studies on disaster management and socioeconomic impacts.